Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to, to share some of the work that we're doing in the lab, um, focusing on aging and the aging brain and how that's more susceptible to stress. So this is a broad overview of what I want to talk about today. I'm going to define stress, um, first of all, and then talk about how that affects the aging brain and can lead to cognitive deficits broadly. Um, and talk a little bit about what I think is the, the hopeful aspect of our research, and that is to determine whether we can find any interventions to prevent um, and treat these conditions. So stress, um, everybody says they've experienced stress. Uh, it can come from care, uh, giving care to a, a loved one who's ill. Um, actually, the caregiver stress is one of the most significant stressors, and um, does increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease, um, according to some epidemiological studies. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this and not having enough hours in the day to meet your deadlines. Um, I certainly don't have enough. Um, for me and many of my colleagues here, the stress of um, obtaining a chunk of that limited NIH budget is always a, a consistent and chronic stressor for us. Um, certainly, um, we're all familiar with the current political climate. Um, and so all of these together can exert a strain on, on the body and, um, you know, we need to be able to cope with these stressors. And uh, the word stress actually is derived from the field of physics. So Hans Selye um, first coined that term, to, took the term stress and applied it to um, this strain that we experience. And that's why we use that term stress, and it usually has a, a negative connotation, but really I, I want to emphasize that we need to have a stress response in order to survive. And this is just a very brief cartoon of, of a, a normal, healthy stress response. And as you can see here, um, a stressor like the lightning bolt hitting your head here um, activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this initiates a whole variety of physiological responses that are normal, and it should help us to cope with a stressor once we encounter it. Um, one of the most important aspects of this, this um, system is the feedback. So this negative feedback arrow here um, tells our brain to stop once the stressor is no longer a threat to us. And hopefully that's what will happen when I step off this stage for me. <laughs> um, so this is a tightly regulated response. It's a normal response that I, I mentioned earlier, and it helps us to cope with stressors. However, if we're exposed to chronic stress, or if this um, system somehow becomes dysregulated and chronically turned on, for example, or chronically turned off, um, it can result in a whole variety of different conditions. Um, we are usually you know, associating chronic stress with de uh, development of depression, anxiety-like behavior, um, anxiety, and psychiatric conditions, but it's also associated with development of things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and um, impairments in reproductive uh, function. So how does this stress and chronic stress impact the aging brain? The aged brain is, is more susceptible to stressors, um, and we are using animal models in the lab. I'm a basic scientist, and um, we use mouse models to study what stress affect, how stress affects the brain. And so in this uh, experiment, we took old and young animals, and we exposed them to a variety of different stressors over the course of two weeks. And then we asked them to tell us about their learning and memory. So we asked them to solve a maze. And um, in this paradigm, animals that learn the maze effectively, like these normal non-stressed animals shown here in blue will find, will solve it quicker and quicker over the course of time. We found that these young stressed animals um, were slower to learn this task, but eventually did learn it and could remember it. But as you can see here on the top, um, the aged stressed animals just didn't learn it and couldn't, re of course, couldn't recall it in the end. And Work in, in the field um, by many, many others um, have identified different regions of the brain that we know are influenced by the stress and are also involved in cognitive function. And um, I'm going to just show you a, a little bit of data. Whoops. Okay. Um, this is going the wrong way. Okay. Um, a little bit of data from the hippocampus here, um, and 
I really like this, this brain region, not only because it's involved in my research, but it has a cool name. And, um, hippocampus actually means uh, seahorse um, in Greek, and it's because if you pull out that hippocampus from your brain, it looks uh, like the shape of a seahorse. And what you see here on the right side, sorry, is an uh, image of the uh, human hippocampus. So if we look at the neurons in this region, following chronic stress, you can see that um, there's a significant amount of remodeling um, in the stressed animal compared to the control animal. They have much less um, branching. And if we terminate the stressor and let them recover, what you find here, um, so this is um, the structure in young, middle-aged, and aged animals that have experienced a stressor and um, you see significant remodeling in all of these groups, but if we let them recover, um, you see that the young animals are able to compensate for that. They recover their, that branching. Um, those are attenuated in the middle-aged animals, but in the aged animals, there really isn't any recovery um, evident at all. And so there's a persistent um, change here in the hippocampus. And, um, what we're interested in is, you know, how does this happen, but also how can we intervene and perhaps prevent this from happening. So you remember these data, I showed you that the age that stressed animals don't learn very well. So we took some old animals and we stressed them again, but before we did that, we gave them some environmental enrichment. So typically, um, Mice are housed in these standard cages. It's, it's relatively barren except for some bedding materials. Um, but we gave some of the mice these enriched cages where they had some toys to play with. It was a larger cage. Um, and they could afford a little bit more activity. And so we took the animals. We gave them these cages for a couple of weeks and then stressed them for a couple of weeks. And when we asked them to solve that maze task again, what you can see here is that the age stress animals, yes, they can't learn this um, task, but those that have the enriched cages actually look more like the control non-stressed animals. And so it, it suggested that we either prevent it or um, we're able to mitigate some of that change in the brain. We're currently pursuing um, different mechanisms responsible for this. Now, jumping into the human, does this also occur in humans? Um, this is one study that took um, older adults, they were 65 to 67 years old. Um, there were 120 um, people in this study, and what they did was they took images of their brains before and after an intervention over the course of one year. And so the people either had exercise, this was moderate aerobic exercise over um, three days a week, um, versus people that were just given some stretching exercises. And what they found is that after a year, the volume of the hippocampus shown here um, was larger in the people that had the exercise intervention. Um, it was specific to this brain region, so the other brain regions didn't show any changes in volume. And these people also performed better when they were given a, a learning and memory task. So it suggests that maybe some exercise or some type of intervention um, enriched environments can uh, affect the brain and have um, beneficial consequences. And certainly, um, based on some of the work that Dr. Houdinier has done and many others, um, we do know now that the brain is dynamic. It is plastic. It, the neurons can shrink and expand. They can change. Um, we can change the connections. Um, they, they disappear, but they may be replaced, and we may be able to um, encourage that by doing some of these types of interventions. And certainly some new neurons continue to grow in some of the places in the brain, and we may be able to take advantage of that. So some of the um, just general take home messages, um, I just want to emphasize again that stress is an inevitable part of our life, of course, um, but the, the response to that stress is normal and physiological and critical for our survival. Um, but it's when it's chronic or dysregulated um, that it has a de deleterious consequence on um, brain function um, and behavior. And it's um, becoming more and more clear that the age brain is more susceptible to chronic stress and is also less able to adapt. But 
um, at least some of our uh, basic science studies have demonstrated that we can intervene and hopefully take advantage of um, trying to do this with uh, patient populations as well. Um, and finally, I think that identifying biomarkers or markers of brain function is something that we're really very interested in because it's hard to take a, a you can't take a biopsy of the brain to see what its function is. Um, but if we identify different molecules in circulation, perhaps that could give us a window into what the brain um, is doing and give us a, an idea about its health. And finally, um, I just want to acknowledge a lot of my um, colleagues at Hopkins as well as our collaborators that have been involved with this work. Thank you. So in, um, in the human setting, yes. um, what, uh, I mean, you, you have an experimental model for stress. In the human setting, you think about chronic stress. What are your <laughs> distinctions between chronic stress and what you'd say day-to-day -day stress? So I would think about like, that example that I gave earlier on with the caregiver stress. Um, that's a, a chronic, it's unpredictable, and mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's quite severe. I mean, you care about this loved one and, you know, they're suffering. You don't want them to suffer. Um, and actually, that's one of the most significant types of stressors um, in addition to losing a loved one. And um, I think that caring for these people that are um, in these situations, and I think that population is going to grow more and more um, very quickly, um, that we can, you know, hopefully intervene and maybe prevent negative consequences from happening. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks very much. Oh, that way. If you go into many assisted living centers and, mm -hmm. you know, I guess older communities, uh, what can you do in these situations? I see people just sitting around doing nothing almost, and, and I wonder uh, your, your work in terms of uh, enriching the environment. You know, any, any studies going on there that may have an impact uh, in that area? Mm -hmm. um, so I, thinking about the animal model and translating it into the human situation, I would think of it as, um, you know, encouraging social contacts and um, more activity, of course. Um, you mentioned that they're just kind of sitting around and, you know, there's really nothing going on. Um, but I think engagement, um, social supports, and I think Dr. Lake Ketzels is going to talk about some of the interventions that um, they're doing with Alzheimer's caregivers. Um, and that could also have um, beneficial effects in um, keeping loved ones at home and keeping them in a comfortable environment, but also taking care of the, those caregivers that are under significant stress, too. Thank you so much. <laughs>